Welcome to ESG Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. In today's episode, we are discussing end-of-life care in liver disease and how we can improve. This is in honor of the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day. My name is Patricia Kürnzler. I am the current chair of the ESL Nurses and the Light Health Professional Task Force. I will moderate the discussion and I'm pleased to have two guests here who will share their expert opinion. I welcome Professor Phil Larkin. He's a professor of palliative care nursing in the Department of Palliative and Supportive Care at the University Hospital of Lausanne in Switzerland and a specialist in palliative care for over 30 years. And I welcome Dr. Phil Berry. He's a hepatologist and a consultant gastroenterologist working at the Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Trust in London, and he is deeply involved in improving end-of-life care. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start the discussion and ask you first, Phil Barry, as a hepatologist, if you can set up the scene. What do we know about dying in advanced liver disease and what are the current gaps in care? Well, thank you. And thanks for asking me. Um, we know that more and more people are dying with liver disease, maybe a fourfold increase um, in, in the Western world over the last decade. Um, it's one of the areas of, of, of dying which goes up while other areas such as heart disease, maybe even malignancy, goes down. So we have a problem there. We also know that we recognize dying late in this condition and that many patients die in hospital, maybe 70% with end-stage liver disease, which is a, a high number. It's not always wrong to die in hospital, but many prefer to die at home. And we're not great at, at identifying people's goals earlier on. And there are many barriers, and I think we can explore them in the discussion. Barriers for patients, barriers for physicians, barriers for nurses to, to really get in front of this situation. And so there are unmet needs, but I, I think it's also a, an optimistic time. We've had recent guidance from Arzold. We've had um, specialist uh, groups forming throughout Europe to concentrate on this problem. So it's a really um, growing, um, fully engaged um, area. And hence, I think, our discussion today. Yes, thank you for this first insight. I agree. I think... Uh, the activity is, is um, demolated and is increasing. And I'm happy to have you here, Phil Larkin. You are working as a palliative care specialist in Switzerland. Do you have any experience in patients with advanced liver disease in your hospital? And what are the care goals when you are involved? Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Um, so I will say uh, in my practice, um, we would um, on occasion see patients with advanced liver disease um, and it's but it's not common it could be better and I think the reason it could be better is because um, palliative care still unfortunately has a label of being an end of life or terminal care cancer service but actually if you look at the recommendations of the WHO um, uh, who are really pushing a public health model of palliative care, which is a much broader model than cancer, which involves really looking at what they call serious health-related suffering. Um, the, the argument there is that, yes, people, for example, who have advanced liver disease could uh, welcome a palliative care intervention. And there's probably two points of that which are important here in, in the role of palliative care uh, that I have seen in my practice and some of the goals. The first is the potential of um, an early intervention. So there is some evidence, um, I will have to say from uh, 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 cancer, it's a lung cancer population, which shows the early intervention of palliative care has the potential to not only increase the quality of someone's life, but the quantity of someone's life, which of course is a, is a, a good thing. Um, and we're seeing that increasingly now in other diseases or other disease uh, clinical groups, 
where if we can engage with the, the other services earlier, we may have a better outcome for the patients. And so there's a big promotion on the idea of early palliative care. The second thing I think is important is that um, I, for, I think for, for a lot of people, they think of palliative care as the inevitable end. Once you get referred to palliative care, that's it. Um, but actually palliative care in my service, we offer a very large consultation service to other services who have patients who have palliative care needs. And our role as the specialist service is to come in at their request to help them with particularly complex situations where they feel they need some, some support or guidance. That may be around symptom management, or it might be something broader like family care or helping with advanced care planning or something of that nature, which is within our skill set. Um, and the point about the consultation services is that they can step in and step out. And so you're seeing much more now palliative care services being asked to come to support uh, a particular clinical situation. But when that seems to have resolved, the palliative care team can step out and be come back again at a later stage. So I think that in many ways, in many ways, the goals of, of care with palliative care and advanced, uh, and advanced liver disease is really to provide a support to the primary care provider who is the hepatologist and hepatology team when we are needed um, and to work in, in collaboration to provide the best outcome for the patient and the family. Thank you both uh, to give an insight. Um, we have decided to work uh, with a patient statement. I have asked a patient who is 66 years old from my clinic to share his experience with us. I will uh, give an insight uh, what he says about the collaboration. So the situation is seven weeks ago, I felt healthy and fit, but suddenly I was overcome by a total loss of appetite, severe fatigue and water in my stomach. I went to the hospital for a checkup and was diagnosed with incurable liver cancer in addition to the already known liver cirrhosis. I thought that the hepatologist could take care of this problem. However, other aspects quickly came up and I looked into them in detail together with the palliative care specialists. So this is a first uh, statement of this patient. And I think it's interesting that he describes a similar approach uh, as you have mentioned, uh, Phil Larkin, that uh, we are in collaboration with the palliative care specialists. Mm. And uh, probably, Phil Berry, can you give an insight? Is it the same in the UK? Is palliative care also uh, working like a consult consultant service? It does vary. Um, it varies. I mean, I, th I think the statement that you gave from the patient there is, is very interesting. It, it, it illustrates the suddenness of, of how things can change. A patient with cirrhosis suddenly developing cancer. Um, but it also illustrates how smooth that that particular system worked for the patient working with palliative care and agreeing goals but it is very variable we know that many patients die without cancer and and cancer is the is this the standard model or the um, archetypal you know, model for palliative care um, and for conditions that aren't cancer we know that things can be uh, slower you know to recognize the need for palliative care so the example you give is a, is a good example, but we know that that experience isn't common to all. Um, in the UK, um, we, we have palliative care services which are very well developed. They tend to be um, focused on inpatient needs. So people in hospital with acute palliative care needs requiring a lot of expertise and support. Um, and then we have uh, community services. And sometimes they are often different people, different teams, but they communicate closely. Um, we've got some great examples um, in the UK um, of co-working between um, community services and hospitals. But it's quite a, and it's in its infancy, I think. We have you know, two or three or four very good examples, uh, which have been you know, published and written about, where there are regular meetings where specialists uh, from both sides identify patients who are at risk of deterioration, meet with the patients and start discussing advanced care planning, resuscitation, goals of care very early on, 
And we know from the data that those patients who are in contact with those multiple professional groups have a better experience generally. Obviously, there still remain many patients that, that don't have that advantage yet. So um, we're well developed, um, but it's, a, it's an area that needs more focus and more attention. Yeah. Could I just add something to what Phil's saying there? Because I think it's a really important point. Um, you know, more and more palliative care are involved um, where patients are still having levels of active treatment. So there's no um, message that says, that's it, no more, no more curative options or treatment options, now you're going to palliative care. Um, um, and I suppose the language that we use in palliative care, I'm sure in other clinical services as well, is around changing goals of care. Um, and in palliative care, one of the skills that we do have is the ability to change those goals quickly, because of course, as patients deteriorate, they, different, different types of patients deteriorate in different ways. So we have to change our uh, goals quite quickly. I mean, in a, in a community situation, um, it can be within 24, 48 hours. You have to completely revise a plan of care because somebody has gone from being uh, relatively unwell to very close to death. And that involves huge communication um, with the with the teams, um, with the people providing the care on the ground and with the family. Um, and I think that my experience has been that in those meetings that Phil's talking about, where we all come together to do the planning, um, it's, it's really about having clear lines of communication. Um, but another phrase I like to use is cultural humility. So that when I go to the, if I, if I was meeting the hepatologist, I'm going in there with a very clear message that I have very little understanding of the disease of hepatology or of, of liver disease, uh, but I think there's something that I can bring, but I need you to, sh to tell me what I don't know. And maybe we can do a little bit the other way as well, but I think it's helpful if we get an opportunity to, we, we're not coming in to take over. We're not coming in to say, okay, we, we'll take over now. Yeah, I think that's really important that recognizing um, recognizing that the difference in the directions that we come to this, you know, challenge from and also that flexibility or um, agility, you know, to change the, the agenda if the situation changes and that can go both ways. And I think that's really important when we begin to talk about um, parallel uh, working with palliative care and active treatment because um, a patient. Um, may still hope that they can be assessed for transplantation, say, um, unless there are any strong um, factors that make that impossible. Um, and, and it is, we, you're absolutely right, we mustn't rule out the possibility of supportive um, care or even organ support or even referral for transplantation, even if a patient needs palliative care expertise. But that's quite difficult mentally to, to sort yeah. of handle. <laughs> um and we know that if you make uh, you agree that someone's not for resuscitation um in many people's eyes that means oh we won't we won't take them to itu anymore or we won't treat their bleeding and so we have to be careful about the signals we're giving out mm -hmm. so we have to educate educate each other really carefully um and and accept that palliative care does not mean the end of all efforts for life prolonging um therapies yes. we know in reality that many of these patients you won't be fit for transplantation um and there are you know we we, we need to in, improve in recognizing those patients you know, ongoing alcohol dependence you know is is difficult and we have a very um large population i think and growing population of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease say which is typically diagnosed later in life and it's very common i diagnose that in a patient um, you know, beyond 65 or 70, 75 plus. And although age is not a criteria on its own, we know that it's going to be difficult you know, with other comorbidities, heart disease, diabetes, to, to bring them to transplantation. So it's about awareness of which patients you know, are unlikely to, to have that ideal outcome um, and accepting, but accepting that we can offer palliative care without losing sight you know, of life extending treatments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Phil Berry, do you think so? W when I listen to you, uh, do you do you feel that you have uh, now a, a different um, 
how you work with patients. So is it a little bit a culture uh, now that you earlier um, start discussing such involvement of palliative care especially? Yeah, I think absolutely. And, and I think that depends on too much light in here. Um, it depends on, sorry, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, it's very personal. I, I think it depends on your own experience in your career um, and your willingness to engage with those challenging conversations um, and what you've seen as well in your training. You know, I, I've been very much affected by seeing patients um, who um, died very predictably. Um, we all knew it was going to happen, but because we didn't know when, um, and because they may have not been seemingly open to discussing the end of life or their family were not open to discussing it, we, we hid away from the difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And you have to be a little bit brave sometimes to open that discussion. Um, but sometimes you don't know how it's going to go until you start. And, and the patient or the family will say, oh, I'm so glad we're discussing this. You know, I, it's been worrying us. But sometimes it doesn't go so well. And it's a great shock to the patient and their family to to even know that they have something that's incurable and and it's a real shame that they would have got that far without understanding it so you don't want to be the bringer of doom and gloom but at the same time you want to bring honesty um, and that involves some personal development i think among hepatologists and all doctors and it probably involves some specialized training and it involves the expertise of palliative care colleagues who are really good you know this they have very advanced communication skills um but it does need i think every liver specialist to sort of reflect on the patients they're seeing and i, I would argue that there are very few ward rounds in hospital on a liver service that wouldn't involve that discussion you know on a week by week basis you know, given the number of patients we have and what is the, the nurse's role within do they also have a generalist palliative care education or do you know that well it's uh, I, I think this brings us to the need for specialized nursing um curriculums mm -hmm. and um and training um and the best services that i'm aware of uh, there are um dedicated palliative care hepatology nurses or at least hepatology nurses with um specific training in palliative care mm -hmm. and w we know that doctors busy doctors sometimes need a nurse to to sort of point point out the fact that a certain discussion hasn't been had um or the resuscitation status remains um unclear um and we also i mean it's a little bit of a traditional viewpoint but sometimes um nursing staff do have more capacity uh, time wise to to follow up conversations and spend a bit more time uh, making a relationship and, and having a deeper conversation. So if I could just respond to, uh, to the, the, the issue that Phil raises about nurses being a nurse. Um, I think that there is a, a strong um, push towards um, generalist palliative care education and training. And in the sense that, again, I go back to, you know, WHO and, uh, uh, re you know, requirements that all healthcare professionals, not just nurses, have a general basic understanding of palliative care principles. And certainly I would see here, where I'm based in, in, in the French part of Switzerland, um, in our um, certificate courses for palliative care, we often in, um, we would often try to uh, involve nurses from a wide range of disciplines. And I have seen nurses from hepatology services come to those um, to those sessions, which is is, is really very very good, um, and I do believe I think the point that Phil made about nurses having perhaps capacity and time is essential. One of the skills that I think it's really important for nurses to learn is the is the ability of follow up. So you know we do these ward rounds where we go and see the patients and we we discuss things with them, and I I always say to the nurses you must go back and check you know uh, Dr Berry came and he he. Made May have given some news you know is what did you hear when he said that um because uh my uh, just thinking of an earlier comment there you know i i would say that there are still patients that i would go and see um where a referral to palliative care has been made and they are shocked 
it's even though it's very clear and it's written in the clinical notes, you know, uh, referral to palliative care discussed. Um, I think when patients get the realization of what they think that means, not what it is, that's when they may have a bit of a, a you know, a, a bit of a panic. And so I always try if I if I'm going to see somebody for the first time as a advanced practitioner or whatever, I try to go with one of the nurses from that service. Um, in that case, a hepatology nurse, somebody that the person feels familiar with and perhaps also understood the discussion that was had internally in the service about the referral to palliative care. So it becomes a little bit less clunky, a bit more seamless, um, and then it, it just makes it a, a, a safer place for the patient to feel comfortable that, that we're trying to work together to provide the best outcome for him. I think that's that's really important and it gets to how we structure or restructure our sort of classical services mm -hmm. clinics ward rounds to take into account the, the complexity and the need for, for follow-up um i mean we've we've worked on a advanced chronic liver disease clinic where there's much more time spent you know per person with the dietitian specialist nurse and yeah. it gives you the time to get into those um other factors which which you to make a difference, you really need to explore. Um, that might be their economic situation or, or the caregiver's situation, um, their their understanding, definitely. And, and also, in terms of follow-up, have to take into account the fluctuating mental capacity of many patients. Um, mm -hmm. You know, encephalopathy is a, a really important barrier to engaging in this area, yeah, especially yeah. when patients are acutely unwell, you know, admitted with sepsis or after a bleed um they they may not be able to engage or take in any of this you know, for the first you know few days or couple of weeks um and, and that is that follow-up that need that you need to understand the trajectory as well as where they're going and i think i'm i'm very wary of making um judgments based on single assessments you know in time where you see patients not at their best um and their functional status is is not a fair reflection of of what they are like at home um, and this is important also when it comes to deciding on um, levels of care and escalation of care. You know, do you have all the data? Do you understand the case well enough to, to make or recommend those firm, you know, firm ceilings of care? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be unrealistic, but you don't want to um, you don't want to rush to judgment either. So, you know, as a whole, I think if we're going to encourage this area of hepatology, we need to accept that it will need more time slight restructuring of services, um, all those things that are very difficult in uh, especially public <laughs> health systems, yes, but yes. Um, but it can be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think in palliative care, we just have to be careful not to, uh, I think you said rush to judgment, rush to the, the diagnosis of dying, um, because most of our understanding of that, of course, is based on cancer populations. And to some degree, perhaps we're a little bit better at being able to do that. But with patients who have other, have other chronic life limiting illness, um, you know, we, we, we may not understand that, how this works. And you can see where a clinical intervention of the treatment of sepsis or whatever will actually, the patient will recover, okay? And we may have inadvertently, not knowing that, gone down the wrong road with the patient or with the family about where things are at. And that's why that dialogue is so essential to make sure that we're giving clear and concise information that helps people understand where they are at now. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, I've certainly got into trouble with having that conversation with patients and families. And then six months later, you know, coming to clinic and saying, Dr. Berry, you, you said I was going to die and look, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, still yes. here, still here. Um, yes. and 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 we it's this uncertainty you know that the managing uncertainty is so difficult because yes. as many times we get it right as we get it wrong and we don't have the conversation and, and an opportunity is is missed you know to, yes. to to deliver or facilitate what we call a good death yeah. um uh, we always will be wrong but it's if we have those systems in place over time we'll move in the right direction i think yeah yeah mm. So uh, I, I can hear it. So collaboration and interprofessional work is really essential uh, to take care of these patients. Probably um, we come, I think we run out of time at the moment, but just to be clear, 
Phil Barry, do you have some indicators leading you to, re to do the referral to the palliative care team? Uh, do you have a system in mind or a, a specific score or is it all gut feeling? It's certainly a, a, a mixture and I'm a bit wary of, of models, but I think the models, um, prognostic scores, etc. But uh, many of them are developed in, in research settings. But in palliative care, I think, or end stage liver disease, I think we have some tools which are very sensible. Um, there's something called the SPICT uh, criteria, SPICT, and another set of criteria that came from a study in, in Bristol um, uh, in the UK. And it's based on those common sense markers that, would, that everybody would understand um, around recognizing the trajectory, um, the stage of liver disease, child PUC, that's quite straightforward. Um, recurrent admissions with, with complications um, you know, more than two in a six month period, you know there's something um, you know, wrong if that keeps happening. And, and the absence of a transplant uh, route is important. We've talked about transplantation not being the be all and end all, but if you know the transplantation is contraindicated for whatever reason, um, then um, there is no cure for the liver disease um, by definition, if it's a progressive liver disease. Um, continuing alcohol use, if it's alcoholic liver disease, it, that's the cause. And if that can't be addressed, um, then the disease will get worse. Um, nutritional status is very important, nut nutritional reserve, um, chronic encephalopathy, episodes of bacterial peritonitis. These are very medically easily recognizable um, incidents and events which, which we can, which should allow us to think, okay, um, so this isn't going to get better on its own. So maybe we should, um, you know, let's just see how we go. Uh, and, and, but we should engage in this discussion, especially if there's been no understanding about that. Uh, so I don't tend to take a little bit of paper and write down these things and, and develop a score, but I'm very much guided by some of the evidence that has been um, developed, which we know um, is strongly correlated to um, likely mortality, you know, in the next, in the next six or 12 months. Thank you. And, and on your side, uh, Phil Larkin, as a palliative care specialist, what are your expectations when you get a referral? of a patient or how do you jump in? Um, well, I suppose usually, generally speaking, um, although it does vary from place to place, referrals tend to be medical to medical. So usually the referral would come through the medical line. Um, but normally what we would try to do is to set up a, a team call of some description where we can sit down and, and listen to the points that uh, 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 Phil has just made, you know, what, what makes you think this patient is, uh, is in need of a palliative care referral? And I will say that there have been occasions, um, I can be aware of, not in hepatology, where we said we're not sure that really this is the right route at the moment, you know, um, but we'd still try and provide uh, some offer there. We also are very clear then about what we can and cannot provide, and I think that's very important. Um, because palliative care is practiced differently in, in practically every country in the world, it's really important that we're very clear about what we, who we are and what we do. And, um, you know, it may be that when we listen to a certain situation, we may be saying, well, we think we need to involve the social worker here because it's a family situation. Or, you know, uh, maybe we need to um, involve community care services because this gentleman's going to be discharged home. And so there will be a community care piece that needs to be engaged here. Like, I mean, uh, as I said, the models vary. Um, so in some ways that, 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 that initial, those initial uh, conversations are around how do we plan this care? And then the second part of that is once we've made referrals and we've had meetings is that there is a clear line of communication back to the, to the service so that they know what we've done um, if we if we feel we have to make very particular decisions that they're discussed in advance, if, for example, the patient remains under the hepatology service so that we don't make a decision which may seem palliatively sensible, 
but actually there's something in the bigger picture for this patient that we don't know. Because ex the reality is that sometimes I would say when we work with families, um, we don't always get the full story at the beginning. <laughs> You've got to work along uh, to get that out. And time is perhaps limited. So that clarity of, of understanding at the beginning is huge. Thank you. So I would like to give you a, a last question for a short answer. So you are both enthusiastic uh, about working together and improving end of life care. What would be the next step to improve our services? In, in your eyes, what do you think? What, will, what is crucial that we have to solve? Which problem first? Shall I take that? Yeah, you go first. <laughs> um, I think it's, um, there is no short answer. Um, we need to structure it. We need to structure it at the level of training for doctors and nurses for have, to have confidence about thinking about that. Our, our entire training is focused on preserving life for as long as possible sometimes. And we need to understand the role of, of early recognition, advanced care planning, palliative care. But then there's also organizational um, change for our clinical leaders to really um, advocate for, for the people and the time required to, to give as good a service as possible and collaboration, the spirit of collaboration, which there are some great examples of, um, but we need to continue to, to, to work on that. And I think from the palliative care side, we need to make sure that the messages about who we are uh, and what we do are very clear um, so that people who may think we're an end of life cancer service realize that actually this team has something that they can pop forward and and support our patients and it is changing I mean I have seen I do see very good examples of positive change but I think we could do a little bit more to hone our message about what palliative care is and is not which will make it easier then for other clinical teams to say yes there's something there that would be helpful for my patient. So uh, thank you both um, I have to close this interesting discussion I would like to summarize some learnings I have had now. Uh, so I think without that, we can say uh, improving end of life care is important in our patients. And for this, we need specific skills or also general, general skills in our hepatology teams that we can improve and work in interprofessionally together. And uh, I think you have uh, good examples brought in about how it can work and should work. So uh, thank you for being here. Next week, uh, hear all about the role of the gut microbiome in liver disease. Remember to become and join Easel family. <laughs>